Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Sophronia Scott, director of the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, and this is Poets and the MFA. Tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about our program, but also sharing with you some teaching to see what it would be like to study poetry at the graduate level. I am going to share my screen with you. We'll, we're going to start off with a few details about the program. I will also introduce to you our wonderful faculty who are with us this evening, and then we will go from there. Okay. Leslie, you guys, are you seeing that? Is that working? Yes. Okay, thank you. So our faculty with us for this evening, uh, again, I'm Sophronia Scott. I am the director of the program. Leslie Contreras Schwartz and Robert Vivian are your faculty for this evening. Leslie is a 2021 Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellow and the 2019-2021 Houston Poet Laureate. She is the author of four collections of poetry, Black Dove Paloma Negra, which was named a finalist for the Helen C. Smith Memorial Award for 2020 Best Book of Poetry from the Texas Institute of Letters, Fuego, and also the book Night Bloom and Cenote, a semi-finalist for the 2017 Tupelo Press Dorset Prize judged by Ilya Kaminsky. Leslie is a proud disabled poet and community activist. Her poet laureate community work includes writing a workshop resource book on poetry for healing, storytelling and mental wellness and overseeing murals from COVID communal poems. She curated from Houstonians submitted poems. Her work has appeared in Catapult, Missouri Review, Iowa Review, Pank, Public Square and, Z and Zancax, 21 Mexican American writers of the 21st century. Leslie was born in Houston, Texas with Mexican American and Mexican roots going back several generations in Houston and Texas. Robert Vivian was born in Denver, Colorado and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. Dozens of his plays have been produced in New York City and elsewhere, and his poems, essays, and stories have appeared in many literary journals, including Georgia Review, Harper's, Ecotone, Creative Nonfiction, and others. He has published four novels, two collections of meditative essays, and his latest published work is a book called All I Feel is Rivers, and an anthology co-edited with Joel Peckham called Wild Gods, the Ecstatic in Contemporary Poetry. He's been a professor in Alma's English department mm -hmm. since 2001. He has visited and taught in Turkey several times and has been heavily influenced by the works of Rumi. In the summer, he tries to fly fish in Northern Michigan every day. And when he can't, he dreams about it anyway. And that piece will come back in a moment because I'm going to share with you some wonderful features about our program. So the Alma College MFA is a two-year degree, and it's a low residency format, which means you're only on campus for two 10-day residencies. You work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor for the rest of the term, submitting a monthly packet of about 25 pages of critical and creative work. This format is especially helpful for people who are already in careers, who can't move for one reason or another, usually because they have family and other responsibilities. So this allows them a way into the writing life and into a community that has support and provides consistency for a writing practice. Our residencies take place in a, a, a number of locations. In the summers, we are on the Alma campus in the beautiful Wright Lapine Opera House. It is a beautiful location. You see our sunny, sunny ballroom. That's where our lectures and a lot of readings take place. Uh, the building also houses beautiful apartment style rooms where our, our students stay for the residency. The middle image is from the Ralph A. McMullen Center. That is where we are located in the winter for our January residencies. Another beautiful location run by the state of Michigan, a conference center basically on the shore of Higgins Lake in beautiful pine woods of Northern Michigan. Beginning in 2024, we will 
offer the option of international residencies. Right now, the plan is to have an Italy residency in January of 2024 and the option of doing summer residency in Oxford, England. And those details will be forthcoming as they take shape. I'm going to go through the next few slides. Basically, this it tells you what happens at our residencies. You attend, and it's a pretty intensive 10 days. You attend lectures every single day, and you attend lectures in all genres, not just poetry. So lectures in uh, fiction and nonfiction as well. You will attend workshop. That is the classroom experience, the small classroom experience where your work is read by your classmates and faculty, and it it is critiqued and you also provide feedback for your classmates. It's also the place where uh, the, the intensive learning of the specifics of what is missing in your uh, craft work. Um, you see an image there of Danielle Clayton at the board, uh, basically outlining some, some very basic specifics of fiction, if I remember correctly, what was going on in that particular workshop, because she and Karen Bender had realized that not everyone had the same experiences, and so they were starting off just getting everyone on the same page with certain craft basics. These images are the faculty interviews. So you get to interview one-on-one, -on -one, few minutes each, all of the faculty, and then you submit a preference form um, to decide who you're going to work with uh, for that particular semester. Once you get assigned your faculty mentor, you have study plan meetings throughout the residency to shape, and to shape your uh, work for the coming semester. You will collaborate on a reading list and you will have a schedule of those five packets, what will be included in each packet and what the overall goal for your learning will be for that term. We also have professional development panels because we believe, and this is something, this is the unique feature for the ALMA MFA. You will find that other MFA programs uh, don't speak a lot about the professional slash publishing experience, but we believe it's important for the students to have professional development, to learn how to submit their work, to understand how the publishing world works. So we have panels at each residency for this learning. We also have visiting writers who share their particular experience as professional writers and also anything that they have learned along the way uh, as they developed their careers. We have readings and uh, these images are our faculty reading uh, from this past summer and also last winter. And our students read as well. Uh, th this is actually more of a practice element because when you graduate, you're expected to give a 20 minute public reading from your creative thesis. And that's, that's hard. A, a lot of students do not come to this with experience as uh, public speakers. So we offer a workshop during residency and time for them to practice speaking just for five minutes uh, to get their feet wet, but to get used to reading their work in public. And we also have special activities. This is another unique feature of our MFA that we believe in the study of place to understand the environment in which we are writing, to be inspired that environment, by that environment, and also to learn how to take care of it. So we have uh, activities both indoors and outdoors. You see images from uh, Bob Vivian's workshop from this summer where this, his students went fly fishing. And below, we went uh, cross-country skiing last winter. And of course, the informal time is hugely important. Just that those off hours where we are spending time with each other. And to me, this is where the magic of residency happens, where we are sharing ideas, getting inspired, and, and basically bonding over this thing, this writing that we love so much. So that's the Alma MFA. I will stop this share so that you can get to your learning from your instructors. And we can talk a little bit when this is over. You can ask questions about uh, what Leslie and Bob present, but also you can ask me questions about the application process. So I will turn it over to you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. I am very honored to be a part of this faculty and to be a part of the community. Um, and I'm here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is how to write about social justice or issues that in the historical moment, um, 
but write about it in ways that that strive to make personal connections with the readers. So I'm going to be showing you a few poems by some of my favorite writers. I'm gonna pull up a slideshow. Pull it up for you. Okay, so the first poem I want to talk about is uh, from the book Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude by Ross Gay. And in this book, he confronts um, issues around uh, racial injustice, um, homophobia, um, uh, living as a Black man. But the focus that he brings to his poems are around the idea of care for each other, care of the environment, and the friendships that uh, 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 between his loved ones, with friends, um, he, despite the fact that a lot of it is about loss, that uh, these friends have passed away. But it's done in a way where we're invited to the poems, we're invited to, to go on this journey with the poet and to be able to enter into these difficult topics. So bear with me for a second. So Leslie, is this also the, the poem, uh, the Ross Gay poem? Yes. Um, no, I, what I'm sending you is just the um, PowerPoint. Okay. But do you want me to put the link to the poem in the Oh, chat? sure. Yes, um, if you could. Okay. So this is, everyone, this is the link to the poem by Ross Gay that Leslie is going to be discussing. I like and I, I apologize for these technical snafus. I, I should have it up and running. That is okay. I like the title of this poem, Fig Tree, Ninth and Christian. <laughs> okay. That is not cooperating, so I'll just go ahead and go into the poems. Um, so a few things. Um, when writing about social justice and issues, these very serious topics, these concepts, how do we grapple with them without doing it in a broad stroke, without um, generalizing or having a sort of diatribe that shuts the reader out? Um, so one of the ways that poets manage this is by turning to the personal, turning to the narrative, um, focusing on um, important imagery. So, uh, you know, the lyric poem, focusing on a, pre a, mo a moment that holds incredible power. Um, so these tools, these poetic craft tools can help the poem become more than uh, one dimensional, makes it more complex. So the first poem, um, actually I was going to show you is Spoon by Ross Gay and I have audio. Let me see if I could share that with you. Still denying me access. Can I share it in the chat, the link? Yes. And and I can maybe I can turn it on. So yeah, okay. There and put it in the chat, and I will turn it on. Okay. Now, just uh, as a warning, his poems are long-winded, but they are worth it, <laughs> and um, you will understand why. Um, we are taken on a journey. The, uh, the long windedness is important to the poem. So can you see the sound cloud? Uh, yes. Okay, so we'll click on that. Should be going. Spoon for Don Belton. 
who sits like this on the kitchen floor at two in the morning, turning over and over the small silent body in his hands with his eyes closed, fingering the ornate tendrils of ivy cast delicately into the spoon that came home months. No, let me start. <laughs> I want to keep going. I want to okay, keep going. Yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Into the spoon that came home with me eight months ago from a potluck next door, during which the birthday boy, so lush on smoke and drink and cake, made like a baby and slept on the floor with his thumb in his mouth until he stumbled through my garden to my house the next morning, where I was frying up stovetop sweet potato biscuits and making himself at home as was his way. After sampling one of my bricks, told me I could add some baking powder to his and could I put on some coffee and turn up the Nina Simone and rub maybe his feet, which I did, the baking powder, stirring it in. And I like to think, unlikely though it is, those were the finest biscuits Don ever ate. For there was organic coconut oil and syrup bought from a hollering man at the market who wears a rainbow cap and dances to disguise his sorrow. And it might be a ridiculous wish, but the sweet potatoes came from a colony just beyond my back door smothering with their vines the grass and doing their part to make my yard look ragged and wild to untrained eyes. The kale and chard so rampant, some stalks unbeknownst drooped into the straw mulch, and the cherry tomatoes shone like ornaments on a drunken Christmas tree, and the blackberry vines gnawed through their rusty half-assed trellis. This in Indiana, where I... And it might be a ridiculous wish, but the sweet potatoes came from a notes drooped into the straw mulch and the cherry tomatoes shone like ornaments on a drunken Christmas tree and the blackberry vines gnawed through their rusty half-assed trellis. This in Indiana, where I am really not from, where for years Negroes weren't even allowed entry and where the rest stop graffiti might confirm the endurance of such sentiments. And when I worried about this to Don on a cool September evening. Sophronia. I just want to pause that in his kindness there is a racial world, epithet and no, in my anxiety in this poem okay. having been around it's here on earth it's in in Martinville a few weeks okay. back and been addressed most unkindly by a passing truck or two trucks okay. likely adorned with the stars and bars knowing that typhoons race makes our minds do running so the locks looking into the sky first down back. fourth but as a wind sense this way oh, and that i, I think that's through backyards hopping a fence or two not i think that, i think maybe people are playing it at the same time i think so too yeah so if everyone can just let Sophronia play it so that we're all hearing the same poem. Yeah, I just that's I wonder what happened because I yeah, I think I think <laughs> I think multiple people are playing it at the same time. So we're hearing different pieces. But I did want to say I, I should give a warning that the N-word is used um in this poem. So so but you you still want me to continue it, right? Yes, um, because it is about. Uh, ra racism. Okay. Take my eyes from him, not wanting to lose him as he sails in and out of the low clouds, looking down with his sad eyes, just as he did when he said at breakfast, I'm a survivor. I survived. This 53 year old gay black man to which we did a little dance, listing the myriad bullets he dodged, swirling the biscuits in their oily syrup, Don occasionally poking his fork into the air for emphasis, laughing and sipping coffee and shaking our heads like we couldn't believe it. And having survived, Don wanted a child to love and we made plans that I might make the baby with my sweetie and he could be the real dad, reading and cooking and worrying while I played in the garden and my sweetheart made the dough, which maybe would have worked, though Don never once cleaned a dish. And when I told him to put his goddamn plate in the sink, he writhed in his seat and called me bitch before plopping it in, returning to his destiny's child tune about survival, while he scooped and slurped the remaining batter with this spoon in my hands, into which I stare, seeing none of this. I swore when I got into this poem 
I would convert this sorrow into some kind of honey with the little musics I can sometimes make with these scribbled artifacts of our desolation. I can't even make a metaphor of my reflection upside down and barely visible in the spoon. I wish one single thing made sense. To which I say, oh, get over yourself. That's not the point. After Don was murdered, I dreamt of him, hugging him and saying, you have to go now. Fixing his scarf and pulling his wool overcoat snug, weeping and tugging down his furry Russian cap to protect his ears, kissing his eyes and cheeks again and again. You have to go, cinching his coat tight by the lapels for which Don peered at me again with those sad eyes or through me or into me, the way my dead do sometimes, looking straight into their homes which hopefully have flowers in the vase on a big wooden table and a comfortable chair or two and huge windows through which light pours to wash clean and make a touch less awful what forever otherwise will hurt. This poem in particular, uh, this book talks a lot about loss and um, addresses racism. And in this poem, we, we, um, he addresses this the murder of his friend that is likely motivated by racism and homophobia. But he focuses the poem, he brings us into the poem, guides us as a reader into the poem through this journey of their friendship. This, you know, using figurative language, focusing on the imagery of the, of the memories of this friendship, and slowly building it, building into the poem, uh, a hint for us when the dream happens and he's imagining Don uh, being tethered uh, by a rope and he's trying to hold him down, that uh, using the imagination to indicate to us that something's coming. And then we get very plainly the fact that he has been murdered and there's this huge loss and grief. So writing a poem that is this heavy in topic, it's difficult because if we give up front something that's happened, um, most readers might be repelled and they may not want to, to enter that poem or um, they might not fully listen to everything that you have to say in the poem. So one of the things that makes it accessible to the reader is by drawing you in with the personal narrative. Um, again, I'll show another uh, poem that is similar to this, um, but I just wanna say a few things about this poem. Um, he doesn't gloss over the, the cold reality of his friend's death and the fact that of the racism that he faces or his friend faced. Um, but the specificity of the friendship and the, the journey that they took keeps the poem from becoming one dimensional. It adds complexity and allows the re reader to engage with it. So the next poem is much shorter. Um, there's two poems and that is in a document. Uh, Sophronia, are you able to share that in the chat? Um, you're muted. Which one? It's um, the one by Irene Laura Silva. Yes. Thank you. So these poems um, take on a different topic um, and they are about the personal experience of physical illness and facing medical discrimination. But the poems centers, again, storytelling and care and gratitude, gratitude for moments when their body is treated with grace. And the second poem is um, focused on resilience and uh, denial of being seen as uh, something shameful. So uh, um, an, an empowered poem. Are you sharing it? Uh, just a second. No, I can't. Okay. 
So this first poem is a lyrical poem about an experience in the doctor's office. Grace, another examining room. The young physician's assistant walks in, greets me, glances over my file, puts everything down. Let's take a look at your feet to start, she says. I bend down to take off my shoes, but she stops me, kneels down. I apologize for not having had a pedicure for my unpainted toenails. She waves away my apologies and takes my right foot in her hands and carefully removes the shoe, then the sock. She holds my foot carefully and asks me to close my eyes. Do you feel this, she asks, and this, and this, and what about here, and this? Wonderful, she says, you've lost no feeling at all. She releases my right foot and lifts the left one and treats it as gently and respectfully as the first. I want to cry, I want to thank her, but I don't have the words. Years of the doctor turning away while I remove my shoes. Years of them wincing and trying not to touch my skin with their gloved hands, my still strong and sensitive feet made ugly. No one had ever treated my feet this way. It was a gift to be seen as a person who'd known joy and suffered pain, not the automaton that doctors had poked and prodded, doctors who never warned me before they hurt me, who never even said, this might hurt. Doctors who'd seen me at my most vulnerable and had no human look or touch or word they could spare me. I wanted to cry. This was a gift, as humble and great a gift as if she had washed my feet with her hair. This was a kind of grace, my feet in her hands. How gently she put my socks back on again, how she slipped my shoes back on, how she too saw the beauty of my simple feet. So I'm gonna pause there and talk about that poem. Um, see how my time is. I think I'll just end on that poem, Sophronia. But um, so Irena Laura Silva, who's the author of this poem, um, she uses storytelling to focus on gratitude for a medical practitioner um, and, and the tenderness that she experienced um, with the subtext being the shame and the, the invisibility that the speaker has experienced in the past, um, the medical discrimination, but the emotional focus is on gratitude. Um, there is anger at the dismissal and the experiences that she had before but we have a different focus and a different way to um, understand that discrimination in reality through this very um, compressed poem, lyric poem that gives us just a single image to focus on. So um, I don't wanna take up too much time because I know Bob has some poems to share and I wanna hand it over to him, but thank you for Letting me share these poems with me, uh, with you. Um, these are some of my favorite. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Leslie. That was beautiful. Um, gosh. Um, so I, I would just like to start with a couple of poems, and I'll, I'll, I'll write this in the chat. Um, the, the first one is by the Turkish poet Nazım Hikmet. Um, this. And the poem is called um, Some Advice to Those Who Will Serve Time in Prison. Those. And I'll just read the poem. I'll just start with the poems themselves and then um, try to add to the wisdom of, <laughs> if I can, of what Leslie had to share with us. Um, so here's the poem, it's, it's readily found on like poets.org. Um, if instead of being hanged by the neck, 
You're thrown inside for not giving up hope in the world, your country and people. If you do 10 or 15 years apart from the time you have left, you won't say, better I had swung from the end of a rope like a flag. You'll put your foot down and live. It may not be a pleasure exactly, but it's your solemn duty to live one more day to spite the enemy. Part of you may live alone inside like a stone at the bottom of a well, but the other part must also be caught, so caught up in the flurry of the world that you shiver there inside when outside at 40 days distance a leaf moves to wait for letters inside, to sing sad songs or to lie awake all night staring at the ceiling is sweet but dangerous. Look at your face from shave to shave, forget your age, watch out for lice and for spring nights and always remember to eat every last piece of bread. Also, don't forget to laugh heartily. And who knows, the woman you love may stop loving you. Don't say it, it's no big thing. It's like the snapping of a green branch to the man inside. To think of roses and gardens inside is bad. To think of seas and mountains is good. Read and write without rest. And I also advise weaving and making mirrors. I mean, it's not that you can't pass 10 or 15 years inside and more. You can, as long as the jewel on the left side of your chest doesn't lose its luster. And I love Nazem McMet. There's a story about him he was very unpopular with the Turkish authorities and they threw him in the hull of a battleship and um, it's kind of graphic, but an excrement up to his waist for three days. And he decided to sing all of the songs and poems that he loved at the top of his voice. And he never stopped and they finally let him out. So this is the topic that we've, you know, it's, it, I approach it with fear and trembling because it's it's like oh wow what is art really for <laughs> i had a dear friend in graduate school this was 30 years ago she was much wiser than i was she was a, a feminist and we'd have wonderful discussions and she said bob everything is political and her name was laura and i said no not not everything is political and now that i am in my mid 50s and living through this time in america i think she was right and i was wrong like Leslie said, you know, how do we approach the political? And as Ross Gay does so beautifully, he approaches it kind of through the tender and the personal. Um, because he, you know, it's it's hard to, it's it's that old um, chestnut of Emily Dickinson, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Some things are so glaring and so overwhelming that you can't necessarily approach them directly. You kind of have to, for lack of a better term. Um, tackle them or deal with them through other means, through the, the, the idiosyncratic rather than the absolute direct. The other poem I'd like to read, this is from a dear friend of mine who died uh, in 2001. Um, her name was Susan Adafat Peckham. She was an Iranian um, American poet married to a dear friend of mine, Joel Peckham. And Susie died, um, they were on a Fulbright in Jordan and they ran into a cement truck in the middle of the night. Susie and their firstborn Cyrus were died, were killed instantly and Joel and Darius, who's now at Harvard his first year, uh, survived. Although Joel to this day has chronic pain. Um, but Susie, we all went to graduate school at the University of, of Nebraska and Susie, we were walking down the streets of Omaha once and she said, you know, I really don't feel comfortable in America. I really want to go back to the Middle East. Um, but that's not the whole story. She felt great ambivalence when she was in Iran because, and I'll just read this poem. It's called, they were in um, Tehran. It's called Avenue Vali Asar. And here's the poem. We need another Rosa Parks to pin herself down to that front seat and say, I am too old for later. Smoke folded edges in city air. 
Buses littered streets, dented, worn, old tin cans crushed at the station. I unstuck the front doors, pushed the edges forward and apart to meet the fat thumb pointing backward. Boro Anji, he said, over there. And I turned to see my place among the colored scarves behind. My breasts warm steel rounds at my ribs. I was half sick of standing there, breathing in wet wool of hair, breathing in their breaths. We are not sheep, I said. We are not sheep. A woman turned. I tugged at clinging cloth. Someone shushed me quiet. Do not speak, she said. It is good this way without voice. She dabbed her head and sweat pressed through colored silk. She pushed and shoved the heat for space. I saw her hand grip at the window. I heard the bustle of a large woman behind me telling the others to hear and peasants lolled in their chairs up front, sunned their hairy hands under the smoke of windows, kicked their feet up on empty chairs, leering into the small noises we made. I know that words can't help them here. Hot breath hovers in old wind. A folded sky spreads in Tehran. And I love this poem and I love Susie and miss her dearly. Um, but that first line of the poem, we need another Rosa Parks to pin herself to that front seat and say, I am too old for later. And I've thought of Rosa Parks on many different occasions of, of her, I don't know, her political activism was simply having the dignity to say, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna sit in the back of the bus. I'm a human being. And that simple gesture of just refusing to get up out of her utterly <laughs> worthy seat on a public bus is to me one of the great gestures of, of, of political statement that one can ever make. And so Susie's poem, and I, I think, well, how in my own, way, how can I, these simple gestures that have political resonance, which I offer for all of you just to consider of like what simple act, not to be defiant or to stand out, but just that that, that shows that a, a, a person has dignity and worth and to, as writers, to, to look out for these and to honor these and to um, weave them into our own work you know, uh, Leslie was talking about um, her Mexican heritage, and I've I've been really under the influence. He, I guess he's kind of a. His name is Don Miguel Ruiz, and he's written many books. Probably his most famous is called The Four Agreements. But he has a section in another. I listen to his audio books all the time, where it's the chapter is called A Night with Grandfather. And he's talking with his grandfather and he's a young man. He's trying to impress his grandfather. And he says, the world is so unjust and it's, it's just not, all these things are, are, that are happening are not right. And the grandfather turns to him and he says, Miguel, most people think that the struggle in the world is between good and evil. He said, that isn't true. The real struggle is between the truth and lies. Good and evil are the result of truth and lies. And so for me, I thought, oh, that's what artists do, like Ross Gay, like Leslie, like Sophronia, is that they tell the truth. And I don't know how you all experience our, our current culture at this time, but it's, it's rife with lies and rumors and accusations and poems like Ross Gay and Nazem Ahmed. They're telling truths that we need to hear. And so, my small offering in terms of, you know, politics and writing is to express and search for the truth. And then notions of social justice and political, um, political justice, that's the next step. So, and, and we're all writers and we all, you know, where do we get the truth in our culture? Does it come from our pundits? Does it come from our politicians? I would submit probably not. It comes from our writers. 
It comes from our artist, Toni Morrison, <laughs> beloved. <laughs> These might be uncomfortable truths. These might be truths that were that a lot of the huge segment of the population is not ready to hear. But this is our, our basically our job as writers, like Nazim McMed is giving advice to those who are about to go to prison. I mean, wow, what a an amazing gift he gives to all of us. Um, so Farney, I don't know how much time I have. I mean, I and and Leslie, did you have a poem of your own that you wanted to share in terms of? If there's time, I can share a poem. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, share a poem. And then I, I have one more thing to say and then we'll open it up for questions. Is that okay? Okay. Um, while, while you look for that poem, Leslie, I'm, I'm going to say in response to, to what B just said, you know, um, I, I didn't give an introduction for myself, but I, I earned my undergraduate degree at Harvard. And being someone coming from the Midwest, you know, coming from a family where my father was illiterate and then going to a place like Harvard, people often ask me, well, what was your experience there? And I tell them that my classmates were the experience, that my classmates taught me that what was possible in the world. Number two, they taught me that I had a voice and that it was possible to speak globally and not just locally. Mm. And and even though I'm thinking I'm just one small, you know, little Midwestern girl in the world, that that we can, that I can make even small ripples that that move outward. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons why when we designed this MFA, I felt it extremely important to have a to have an emphasis on having our voice, you know, your voice matters. And I say this because, you know, people come to the program with personal projects in mind, and that's okay. But I want this program to challenge everyone to see that, that what you write may be personal, but as, as Bob just pointed out, it can be hugely global mm -hmm. and, and influencing so much and so many just because you told your one simple truth. Mm -hmm. but that's just what I wanted to add. Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. So this poem is written in the aftermath of Harvey. Um, so it, it does, um, I'll just read it. Houston Tableau, September 6, 2017. A woman in a wheelchair smoking a cigarette at a bus stop. Black shirt, black skirt trailing the wheels. Two young men, dark skin, brightly colored shirts, weaving through stop traffic by foot at a red light. A group of brown men rebuilding a caved in street, laying concrete, dredging up mud, hard hats and emergency orange vests glistening in unison. Rows and rows of bloated mattresses, splintered wood, torn rugs, chairs, sofas, and crumbled dry roll in front of houses. Apartment complex with mounds of indistinguishable waste splintered and hashed wood or fabric or something that looks familiar, remnants of a side table, a desk collapsed and sunken, chair on top of the heat crooked, a blank flag of no color, flood color, mounds full and spilling into the streets, into the lanes, requiring drivers to take, let other cars pass, take turns, almost kind sitting and sitting at red lights, waiting for it to turn. Helicopters still hovering, delivering someone and finding someone. Doll houses, so many doll houses in waste heaps on streets with names like Ariel, Paisley, Lock Lamad, Indigo. People in groups, men in pairs, mothers and children walking from street to street with names like Bissonette, Chimney Rock, Fondren, to find these doll houses, chairs, tables with only one crooked leg, taking with them furniture that bathed in sewage and bayou water and flesh eating bacteria water for weeks. All the apartments with walls punched out or water busted drywalls, black mold flourishing walls, and that baby 
dressed in a diaper, playing on a bare mattress housed by those walls. Complexes with names adorned with green garden, village, colony, oaks, where street lights bust out and stay busted years after the last storm. Everyone in the city feels some type of growling, but hunger is not a metaphor. This city and its machineries, its ratchet wheels and pulleys, that clock face pulled off by drowning. It's the hand to mouth, that look, that kind of hunger, the real kind, a baby on a bare and dirty mattress. This is our city's bloodline. Someone to clean the houses, build the city, feed the city, pay for the city. And the gears kept turned on the tick and groan of Houston's bare frame, somebody else's child, mother, father, or family. Our city washed clean of everything but that. Just roll down the window on any one mile stretch. You'll see our citizens. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. You know, I, I just, um, thank you, Leslie. That was just beautiful. And I, I'm not gonna read the whole, I, and Leslie and Sophronia know I've been working on a series called Sob Artists. And um, for me, I, I don't know, and maybe we can talk about it later, but I have to feel the grief first before I can do anything. So I'm, I'm, I'll just read a part, it's, it's called Sob Artist Take 12. And, um, and now, and it's called, it's after the Su Supreme Court decision, June 24th, 2022. And now suddenly, dear sister, dear daughter, mother, lover, neighbor, watering her flowers and flip-flops made of pink plastic. Your sacred, beautiful body is no longer your own. So here is another vast quaking and tremolo of sobbing for you, for me, for all who ache and laugh and cry and believe that God's greatest gift to any human being is his or her or their own free will, which is given to us to, to use however we want, and what birthing grief has come upon us in this technocratic century of mayhem and sobs for the sisters, sob for the 12 year old niece about to get her first period. Let all the tampons in America sing and wail of sorrow and blood so deep and red it soaks and fills all of Lake Michigan. And the, the essay goes on from there. So it's just one of those. So, I mean, these times that we're living in are just so insane. Um, so my first, uh, as a writer, is to feel the grief, to feel the sob. And then from the sob, not just stay there, but move into some kind of response, some kind of utterance that, that tries, to, <laughs> tries to get my arms around the, you know, the, the injustices that, that we're living through. So that's, that's my piece on... <sighs> Thank you. Thank you all. Let's open it up for questions. I know that was a lot. So uh, Kate, Maggie, if, if you have any questions or comments for Leslie or Bob or, or me about the program, feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you're not going to, let me know and I'll, I'll know to wrap it up. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I don't necessarily have any questions, but um, everything that was read today was absolutely stunning. So I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so, yeah. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Dr. B. <laughs> But do we have a, a, another an Alma alum here? Is that what this is? Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Maggie's a, a beautiful poet. I just have to put that out there, Maggie. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's a given. Maggie, Maggie, come on home. You got it. <laughs> we'll hold a space for you. You got to be with us. <laughs> thank you so much. That's so nice. <laughs> um, 
I did. Okay, I had a question about the program in general, and it's probably definitely not one that would be answered right now, but just in the future. Um, I know a couple of other grad programs offer um, undergrad, like helping with undergrad programs. Um, like they allow their students to help out in undergrad classes, maybe like an English 101. And I was just wondering if that's anything that you might offer for students potentially in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not in the workshop, but the MFA is part of the English department at, at Alma undergrad. Mm, okay. um, so yeah, so we've just you know been getting this up and running. Uh, we're also going yep. to have a connection to the Pine River Anthology in terms of, of working with that literary journal, if not connecting a, a new one to the MFA. But yeah, all of all of these details are, you know, in yeah. the process. <laughs> yeah, got you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll just echo Maggie in, um, uh, it feels kind of like silly for me to ask questions um, after the like profound sharing that you were all willing to do. So thank you. Um, that was really, I have, uh, it really reminded me of why I do what I do. And um, I think it's been a while since I've thought about it as um, an act of potential service versus kind of like a, a business. Um, I think that art often is especially in the, I think art is often um, framed as a business and it was really nice to think about it as a, a, a service again um, for myself and for people that I offer my work to. Um, and all of that is to say that um, I have some really simple questions like about how many people are usually in a cohort and what um, forms are people typically working in? It seems poetry is one, but um, those are kind of really basic questions that I have, if you might have a, an idea to answer those. Yeah, we have fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. So you have the option to do your whole degree in one genre. You can decide to dip your toe in and do one semester in a second genre or you can do a dual, dual genre degree where you stay an extra term and you do three terms in a major genre, two terms in a minor genre. Okay. So um, our first cohort was about 14. Uh, we tend to have fewer join in the winter than in the summer. So this winter cohort, the winter cohorts are like, you know, four to five, and then in the summer, like 10. So it's going to balance out in that way. Uh, ideally, hopefully it'll be similarly in the future but um, we like the cohort to be about 15 per. Okay, and you can start either in the winter or the summer, it's not, okay, yeah. great, thank you. So the, uh, the application deadline for this coming winter is November 1st, and for the summers, it's May 1st. Okay. Thank you. So if there is nothing else, then I will wrap it up for this evening. Leslie, Bob, thank you both. This was absolutely wonderful. We so appreciate you both. Excited to have you both on our faculty. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the people listening to this recording. We are the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing. You can learn more about the program at our website, alma.edu slash MFA. This has been Poets in the MFA. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you.